Good morning and welcome to Ballon Baptist Online. I thought we'd start with a game and it's easy to get involved. You just need to tick off everything that you've done this week. So, have you sent an email, sent a text message, made a phone call, left a voice note, used a WhatsApp message, joined a Microsoft Teams call, had a Zoom call, and then even found time for an online house party? It has been a busy week of communication, but isn't that exactly what we need during this lockdown to get us through this challenging time? And I'm so grateful for the technology that we've been blessed with to connect us even closer. Now this week, as we continue to look at what matters in 2021, Steve will be exploring our core values of investing in one another. Now the news agenda is packed with lots of things that we can't do, but this will give us food for thought about how we can reach out to each other and show one another that we still care. We've also got communion, so please do come prepared. Make sure you've got a drink and some bread or some biscuits to celebrate that with us. But first, we've got a reading from the Book of Psalms. Hi, um, this is our classroom for our schooling. And we're going to read um, Psalm 16, uh, verse 5 to verse 8. The Lord is my portion of mine inheritance and of my cup thou maintainest my lot the lines are fallen unto me in pleasant places ye i have a goodly heritage i will bless the lord who faith give in me conceal my reins also instruct me in the night seasons I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Yep, hang on. Let me just let me just note this down. Dear everybody, I have a confession to make. I am sick of how Christians deal with the world. I think we need a new perspective on how we live in the world without being part of the world. There must be a better way. Don't you ever feel like that? I mean, what is the point of being a Christian? Do you ever wonder that? I do. As I've watched the news over the last few weeks, sometimes I find myself wondering, what is the point of being a Christian when I see Christians supporting the way things are done in our world that seem to go so against what I believe? And don't get me wrong, it's not about pointing fingers. Sometimes I feel it within myself. I see my own behavior or my, uh, my failure to, to engage with the world around me, and I think, Does this thing make any difference? What is the point of being a Christian? What is our salvation actually for? Is it simply that we're Christians because we hope one day we'll get into heaven? Or we're Christians because we want to have a friend in Jesus? Or I'm a Christian because it deals with the shame and guilt in my own life and I just feel a better person for it could it be could it be that God's plan for all things is a much grander story than just how you get a few humans from earth to heaven one day could it be that our salvation is actually for the life of the world but how do you live in this world uh, without, <clears throat> without being kind of swallowed up by it? It's so difficult. We often, or certainly in my lifetime, Christians seem to have taken a kind of us versus them approach to it. I think there are three different ways that we invest our lives in some ways as Christians in, in the world around us. For some, it's been a kind of fortification Put up the walls, shut the world out. It's a kind of a a bunker mentality. Don't engage with the culture 
around you. For some, it's about domination. It's about trying to condemn the culture around us. And Christians get a reputation for all the things they are against. Or it can be about accommodation. It's so challenging to be in the world that when we're out in it, we just become like it and we compromise our beliefs and our behaviors and the way that we are and we don't look any different to anybody else. We don't want to rock the boat. As we begin this year as a church, we're trying to think about our core values. Back in 2014, we came up with these things that we felt were unique to our church. They're built around the word life. We said at the time, and we worked on it together, we, we, we feel like we want to be a community that is, is led by God and we lead other people to him. We want to be a community that invests in others. We want to be a community that recognizes that we're a family of diverse people. That's age and ethnicity and background, all sorts of things. And we want to be a community that equip one another for where we find ourselves on our front lines in our everyday life. Today we're thinking about, well, how do we invest our lives? How do we invest in others? When we first looked at this in 2014, seven years ago, we loved the fact that our church was a community where people valued the individual. We loved the fact that our church was a place where people, even if they were only around for a short time, were invested in. It was a place where you could discover your gifts and work out how to use them. And we, we, we loved the fact that we were a community where we genuinely listened to each other and tried to be honest and sincere with each other, to be real with each other. So we made a board and we hammered some nails into it and one particular weekend we got people with coloured cotton to represent the diversity of our community and we made the letters that you see in the background behind me and we hung it on the wall and the danger with hanging these things on a wall is we can forget what they're about and so we're trying to think well what does it look like to live these out what does it mean for us as humans who are Christians to to invest our lives in others. I've been thinking about this all week. And just so you don't think I come with an immediate idea, I went to a number of different places as I thought about what does it mean to invest in others. I thought about what Jesus says in a, in a story tells called the parable of the talents, where it indicates to us that God gives us, each of us, a variety of, uh, of gifts, as it were, time, talent and treasure and he he expects us to do something with them to invest them i wondered whether that was where we needed to focus today i wondered about the story that jesus tells of the friends who helped the guy who was the bible says uses the word that he was crippled and they they took him uh, they wanted to get him to jesus to be healed and so they they lowered him through the roof of somebody's house And I thought about the way in which they had invested themselves in spotting his need and they came together to do whatever they could to make sure that this man got to Jesus. I thought about the other places in the Bible that talk about investing. I thought about the fact that there are, somebody's counted them, there are 59 one another's in the Bible, all different ways in which we can encourage each other, that we can serve one another, that we can be patient with one another, that we can love one another. There's a lot of one anothering uh, one another in the Bible. All of them seem to indicate that it is about others. It is about investing in others. But somehow those passages weren't landing it for me this time. I could say to you today that what matters is others and you investing in them. And that's true and it's good and it would be well worth your effort investing in the lives of others. But why would you do it? Why would you do it? Would you do it Would you do it, because sometimes I do, to earn brownie points of some sort? Would you do it because you thought you ought to? Or is there something more foundational, more at the core than that? Is investing in others a worthwhile way to live in 2021 because it's at the heart of who God is 
and what he's trying to do in our world. So I landed at probably one of the best-known parts of the Bible there is. Now, it's always a risk to say that, but I think you'll know these words. If, if nothing else, you may have seen the numbers that refer to them, because you often see them at sporting events. 3, colon, 16. John 3, 16, where Jesus states his purpose for coming into our world. I'll read it for you, and I know when I read the Bible, sometimes I try and read it in a couple of different versions, just so I hear it really well. So I'm going to do that, just a couple of verses. One from the, the New International Version. This is John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And then hear it, I'm going to read it from a, a paraphrase of that passage called The Message, and it says it this way. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his Son, his one and only Son. And this is why. So that no one need be destroyed. By believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. He came to help, to put the world right again. Anyone who trusts in him is acquitted. Anyone who refuses to trust in him has long since been under the death sentence without knowing it. And why? Because of that person's failure to believe in the one-of-a-kind Son of God when he introduced himself. Just tune in to some of the things that passage says about who God is. It says, For God so loved the world, God made this world for us and he gave us this incredible purpose as humans of, of cultivating it. God has, has invested in us the raw material of life and he says take it, whether it's the raw material of color or sound or sand or earth, and he says do something with it. I've invested it in you you invest and do something with it. God loves the world that he has made. And then it says, he gave his one and only son. God's love for us is ultimately expressed in, in him coming in the form of his son and ultimately demonstrating his love for us by giving up his life for us on the cross. It's mind-blowing that God would invest in us by coming himself. And what we see happening in the Christian story with Jesus on the cross is, is God dying for us, laying down his life. And then it says, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. So, so those who trust in his version of the story, it, it gives us a reason to bother investing. He's saying there is more to this life than just what we experience here. And he begins to indicate that what we do in this life matters and will continue into this other life called eternity or heaven. And then he says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What God is doing through Jesus is starting again his creation all over again so that he can restore this world that he loves. It's not saying that Jesus came to condemn the world, to, to end its existence, but rather to, to save it, to to help it find its purpose once again. 
Those few sentences, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Those few sentences put a whole new perspective on what it means to, actually what it means to be a human being, what it means to be a Christian. You see, I was taught growing up by Christians that the world, the world was a bad place, that it was to be avoided, that we weren't to love the world. I was taught that I was meant to somehow fortify my life against it, to not go watch certain kind of films, to not go to certain kind of parties, to not be a certain kind of person, not really to engage with the culture around me. I was also taught that I got the idea that God was this angry judge in the sky. Don't get me wrong, I think that God does discipline us in our lives, but he does so out of love, but... What I was taught was this God was, was angry with me and somehow I had to live to please him. So when I, when I invest my life for the sake of the life of the world, I'm living in a different way. Because what that passage is saying is God loves the world, that God himself came and invested in that world by giving up his life so that others could live. And also that... He wants to restore and rescue this very world that we're in. So when I invest in others, I'm being more like the person of Jesus. When I invest in volunteering for the NHS during this time, when I notice a neighbour who needs their shopping doing for them, when I think about a friend of mine who might need a bit of encouragement and I pick up the phone to them, when I write a car to somebody, when I... When I teach a child to ride a bike, when I do my work every day, when I work in banking or in construction or I'm in music or art or theatre or whatever it is, when I invest my time and energy into those things, they have the potential to make a world as God wanted it to be in the first place. What I'm doing when I invest in others... <laughs> is that I'm investing in a world that God loves. So maybe investing in others is about investing in such a way that I do so for the sake of the life of this world that God loves. I wonder, therefore, as we think about this value, how we might begin to practice it in our everyday lives. Maybe you could begin and I could begin this week by starting each day by saying in some way, in a prayer perhaps, Lord, here I am. Would you use me for the sake of others today? And then through that day, just pay attention and ask yourself throughout, how can I invest in somebody else today? How can I bring encouraging words How can I do a kind action? How can I act unselfishly? And perhaps as a physical way of reminding yourself to live that way, why don't you draw a picture of a cross, or if you have one, maybe one like this, just place it somewhere that you're going to see on a daily basis and look at it and be reminded that God so loved the world that he invested himself in it. He came and lived amongst us and he died for us so that others might live. Let's live to invest in the lives of others this coming week. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so, so good. I took a breath, you breathed your life in me. You've been so, so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, it chases me down, fights till I'm. Leaves the 99 I 
couldn't earn it I don't deserve it Still you give yourself away Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love your fault, still your love fought for me, you have been so, so good to me, when I felt no worth, you paid it all for me, you have been so, so kind, We now come to a time of sharing communion together, this simple meal uh, that represents Jesus' body and his blood and what, what that means for us. So if you haven't already, do go and grab something to eat uh, that you can break and something to drink. It, it doesn't matter what that is, whether that's bread, whether that's uh, a cracker, whether that's something else, whether it's a glass of water, a cup of tea, a cup of coffee. Uh, even a, a glass of wine, if, if you're so inclined. Uh, for me, it's a, it's a rice cake, because that's what I can find in the cupboard, 
and also I've got some some peppermint tea because uh, I thought I'd go for the the hot option uh, this week. Well, you find me, you find me uh, in in the church office. Um, most of the time at the moment, uh, I'm working from home uh, with Sarah. Uh, well, she is is homeschooling. Like, she, well, she's leading a classroom of kids at home, um, whilst none of them are at school. Anyway, um, but I'm at, I'm down at the church buildings a, a couple of days a week, uh, and so I thought I'd kind of bring you bring you to this place. Because I thought in our, our first point of taking communion in 2021, it was again good to recognise that God is with us all the time, wherever we find ourselves. And this communion meal, it belongs not just within a kind of church, kind of worship auditorium or sanctuary or however you want to describe that space. Uh, and neither is it just kind of staying in a kitchen or a dining table or anything else like that. But this this is a simple meal reflecting Jesus's presence and his power and his his resurrection power with us each and every single moment of our lives and so what we're going to do today is we we're going to take communion in this place and what I want to encourage you at some point this week uh, is that in your normal ordinary everyday life find the place where you usually find yourself in the days ahead whether that's at the kitchen table whether that's in the front room whether that is in a place of work that you're going to, whether that's at another table with with young children homeschooling them, whether that's in another setting entirely. But think about the place where you find yourself most of the time. And I want to encourage you to come and take this meal again at some point this week. It doesn't need to be elaborate. It can be as simple as you like. If you like, you can, you can come back to this, this video again. It's the beauty of YouTube. Come scan back to this video again later in the week so that you can, you can again, again be led in communion or lead yourself. Some of you will have engaged in enough kind of communion services to know a little of what it's about. And so we come to this bread and this wine, this body and blood of Jesus who is always with us. And so I want to pray. And uh, wherever you find yourself, I just want you to, there's nothing magic in this, but uh, just to kind of grounds us in, in where we are, but just to put your, your hands flat down on a surface. It might be the sofa that you're sat on. It might be a, a coffee table in front of you. It might be a, a table where you are. It might simply be on your, on your legs because you're sat somewhere without a surface or something like that, but just a grounding moment of where you are. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we praise you that you are with us always and everywhere. You are always looking to bring life. You're always looking to lead us in life in all its fullness, wherever we find ourselves. And so, Jesus, would we find you here? Would we find you now? Would we know your power and your presence, your body and your blood with us now and forever? Amen. And so, Jesus... As we read about in, in 1 Corinthians, as Paul writes to a church community trying to, trying to understand this stuff and what it means to, to celebrate this, this Lord's Supper, Communion, Eucharist, whatever you want to call it. This is what he says. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and when he had given thanks, he, he broke it and he said, This is my body, which is for you. He says, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took a cup and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you drink this this wine, whenever you eat this bread, You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so in a moment, as we eat and drink together, I want to reflect upon the Lord's presence being with you. And although in some of us right now, it feels his death is very real in us with all that is going on at the moment. We know in the sure and certain hope that his resurrection means that there is always new life to come. As we hear great words of song being sung over us in a minute, 
as, as the song flows around us, because of this Jesus who lives, we're going to eat and drink in that moment. Amen. I believe in the sun. I believe in the risen one. I believe I overcome by the power of his blood. Amen. We hope you've been inspired by today's message and that you will find ways to reconnect with the people around you. One of my resolutions is to try and write more letters and cards. And it's true what they say, a little does go a long way. So see how you can get involved too. Thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you next week.